welcome to Writer's Corner. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Writer's Corner. My guest today is Jeff Brown, author, co-author of The Winner's Brain, Eight Strategies, Great Minds Used to Achieve Success. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Joe. How are you? I'm great. Good. And your book inspires me. Great. When I'm on the treadmill, sometimes I just look at the title and say, yes. Running winners. success. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So um, thank you for writing this. It caught my eye right away because self-help books are always, always welcome. And um, you've, of course, heard of W. Clement Stone and Napoleon Hill. Sometimes it seems you have to keep reading different material along the same lines to get it to sink in. Mm -hmm. Is that, do I have a good grasp of this? You're right. One thing about self-help books, and, and one thing my co-author, Mark Finsky, who's up at the University of Guelph, one thing that we wanted to be able to do is have a book that people could use to, uh, to aim themselves towards success, but something that was really scientifically based. There are a lot of people that have great stories about how they've met with success, mm -hmm. but we wanted to look at the research and find out how it is that people, the living, healthy, successful brains, are actually meeting with success on a regular basis. So that really is the, the backbone of the winner's brain, is finding out exactly how the human brain works, how it's optimized, and then figuring out ways also to in, incorporate that in our own lives. Uh, we had a fantastic time and actual, uh, actually quite a, quite a challenge going through so much of the research with brain science research today. Um, it's, they're just volumes and it just keeps coming and keeps coming. We are focused on the very current research that's available uh, to us from uh, just within the last uh, you know, six months to a year and a half. That's the, the, the brain science that's really revealing what the brain's capable of doing. We took uh, that information and paired it with, research, uh, with interviews rather, uh, with people who we thought really embodied what the research was telling us the brain's capable of doing. Uh, so it's been a, a very fun ride and we're thrilled uh, to be able to share information with readers about how to optimize their brains and how to, how to enjoy success and contentment in life a bit more. And it's an interesting approach too because for well over 100 years people have come from another direction which is the metaphysical. Uh, that you know you can have a winner's brain but um, oh who was it that said every day in every way I'm getting better and better and better. Email Kue. Mm. Remember that? phrase? Uh, it's ringing a bell. Yeah, way back when. I think it was maybe the 20s, I'm guessing. But people were coming at it, not from a scientific standpoint, but from fumbling through the darkness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's interesting when the two worlds collide, and, and you can now assess the information from a scientific point of view, which mm -hmm. you're doing, mm -hmm. and then from the metaphysical point of view, which is how do you get that visualization that athletes say they use to win? Right, right. That's a great point. And I think that the trick to it as well is doing the scientific piece, also making it something that people can to literally wrap their heads around mm -hmm. because the science today is very technical and very specific, but really boiling that down in a way that we can all use that and incorporate it, I think is, is really, hope, hopefully we've accomplished that. It's almost like you're taking the brain and opening it as if it were a computer and, and analyzing it for people and saying, look, here's how it works. Mm -hmm. Here's the starter button. Here's the drive and neutral and reverse. That's exactly right. When we were, when we were looking through um, the research and, and interviewing folks, we identified five different characteristics that we think people who are meeting with success actually have in place. Um, the first one is the opportunity radar. People who are able to scan their environment, know circumstances in their lives, uh, and so forth, and recognize opportunities that will lead to success. That's very, very important and something that, that um, we think has to happen. Too many people are bypassing opportunities. They're waking, waiting for the, the big something to happen. The ship to come in. They're waiting for their ship to come in. And oftentimes they jump ship before it comes ah. in. And, uh, but we find that people that are successful, uh, I'll give you a good example of that. We talked with, um, with Phyllis Diller. Uh, love her. Love her. <laughs> She's a great comedian and we were impressed by that but more importantly we were impressed by her brain and how her brain functions and how she shared with us. Uh, we didn't look into Phyllis's brain. She'd probably tell us there wasn't much there of her self-deprecating humor but it works for her. Um, the, the, her opportunity radar. She shared that she would um, frequently pass up opportunities uh, to do something else in a different venue rather than perhaps take the most lucrative route because she knew that that next venue would be something else that would lead to another opportunity and then another opportunity. 
So her opportunity radar is, is rather exceptional, and she's got a stellar career to, to really back that up. Uh, we have other, other factors that we call brain power tools, these criteria that need to be in place. Another one is the goal laser. Oh, well, let's go. Uh, yeah, hold, can, sure. Hold that, yeah, thought, hold that thought. I have one of, the, one of Phyllis's <laughs> quotes somewhere in the house, and maybe on the wall. Um, there are no bad audiences, only bad performances. Mm. I love her, but I've, I've, I have her quotes. She's, she's awesome. I have a whole page from her because great person for you to zero in on. She really is a winner. She really, really is. Uh, you know, she spends a lot of time right before a performance and has done this for, for years, she shared with us, that she just spends quiet time letting her brain um, connect with herself and also she starts connecting with her audience before she even sees them and, and allows them and visualizes them getting in tune with her. So again, it's a, it's a, great, <coughs> a great example of how a winner's brain is, is in process. Her, her brain is not one that um, just is sort of on idle. That's what we've, we've kind of dubbed this, that you know, most people just sort of get along in life. They don't really optimize what their brains are capable of doing. And uh, this, uh, this idleness that's going on is kind of eating up our world. Um, people need to prioritize the brain and, and how, uh, how to use the brain and so forth. Oh, that's fascinating. And you have something here, the winner, uh, winners are authentic. You know, that's true. We visited with a lot of people who are, are of celebrity status. We, um, uh, we don't want to send the message that you have to be a celebrity to be a winner. Uh, we spoke with a lot of people that we dubbed the winner's brain next door. People who are doing nice. exceptional things mm -hmm. with their brains. Uh, they may not be out in, in pop culture. They may not uh, be on the late night news or, or, or something like that. But they are people who are maximizing their brains. We spoke uh, in our chapter on focus and attention. Spoke with a, a New York City window washer. Um, literally, we don't even see this guy. He's, he's up, in the, up in the air. Um, but he, he was able to share with us, and we believe that that's a great example of someone who his livelihood and his life really depend on uh, what his brain is capable of doing. Back in 1999, I interviewed Suzanne Vega. Hmm. Um, she has a big hit song, Luca, mm -hmm. and she wrote a book, and, uh, the, the Passionate Eye. And I had her on, and I said, wow, what I love about your book is it it's, reminds me of Lou Reed's book. I can go anywhere in the book and read it. She goes, I designed it that way, and I designed it on Lou Reed's book. So, it, it, and, and you have done a similar thing. I could go to resilience if I want to talk about resilience or if I want to prepare my brain for resilience. I'm like, oh wow, this mm -hmm. is good food for the brain. Exactly. So I'm like, okay, let me jump to win factor number six. And you don't mind that I jump ahead, right? No, jump. that's what the book's written for. Ah, you so you did design it that we way did. too. We did. Several people we're hearing from that are reading the book and, and starting to incorporate the strategies, they do read some of the chapters as if they were individual small books because they do target specific needs, um, things that, that might pop up, whether it's you know, go, you're going through a rough time in life right now, so you want to read the chapter on resilience or the, you know, the economy has slammed you. Or if you know that <coughs> you have difficulty um, uh, paying attention at work. Uh, or staying focused on your job, so the focus and attention chapter is good. So uh, certainly the brain care chapter, the, the last of the win factors, uh, is, is good because it tells us uh, and describes what current research is telling us about how to take care of our brains. Ah, interesting. And, and you know, in this day and age, people see a book like Dune, a science fiction book, and mm -hmm. it's daunting. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have a month if you're going to saturate yourself in a book. So when they see something like this, it isn't intimidating. Right. It's like, wow, I like the concept. Oh, wow, it's easy to read. And so I think that's a good tool for people because you don't have to read the whole book from start to finish. That's right. Put it on the shelf when you need some brain food. I mean, this is just my take on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I have many books like this. And, and my friend Kimberly Yeager, you did her show, yes. CLX. Yes. She's the same way. We've got these type of books and we do enjoy self-help and, and books that can inspire. Mm -hmm. Like but I said, the cover. It's like, inspiring. Good, good. I think the, the cover turned out nicely, and I think they did a great job designing that. Uh, it's a funny little story about uh, the cover, uh, the brain that's embossed on the front. Uh, I asked my little boy, who's almost four, what, what is that? And uh, he looked at it very closely and told me that he thought it looked like pasta. <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, we've had fun and get some, getting some good mileage. Uh, so the winner's brain, in fact, a brain probably does look a little bit like pasta. Uh, but it's, it's interesting because the brain is something that you have to feed. You have to be able to, you have to exercise it. We spoke with Art Kramer um, up at the University of Illinois. Uh, and one thing that his, you know, his, his research focuses on 
making sure that exercise is something that's incorporated in your life, not just as, as a kid uh, and as a young adult, but throughout the lifespan. Exercise is criti critical and very important in getting oxygen and helping the brain to develop and continue um, to um, you know just whirl along at a very nice pace. Um, he even says that you know there are the billion dollar industry, or probably more than a billion now, of the um, of puzzles and games and things for your brain. Those really, and actually research came out just in the last couple of weeks that said that that really isn't necessarily, you might get better at those games, but it's not necessarily uh, something that's going to help you as far as being cognitively sharp. Exercise will do that. Making sure that you feed your brain, uh, not just pasta, but things like omega-6s and 3s, which come in like cold freshwater fish, um, things that come in nuts. Your brain loves berries and unfiltered fruit juices. All kinds of, and there's a nice little graph that we put together so there's a quick reference in that brain care chapter uh, for folks to be able to look at and see what they need to do. They don't have to uh, read through the chapter and, and highlight that. It's there uh, for them to be able to use. And of course, good old H2O. Water's always good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. So that feeds the brain because blood. Yeah, we, we definitely need to be well hydrated. Yes. Uh, sometimes in late in the afternoon, you can kind of feel like you're dragging along and wish you could have a nap. Actually, water can sometimes give you a boost as well. Jeff, what was your book prior to this? Uh, my book prior to this was called The Competitive Edge, um, How to Win Every Time You Compete. And it was a book about character and integrity and competition, uh, whether that was sports or business. Integrity is something that tends to be undervalued in our culture. And uh, definitely The Competitive Edge was one that helped people have uh, strategies in place um, to be able to protect something that has uh, internal value. So you practice in Boston and you're a psychologist? That's right, that's right. I'm on staff at McLean Hospital uh, and Harvard Medical School and I have a private practice in Arlington. Oh, well, I'm so happy you haven't carted me away yet in a straitjacket. <laughs> that's right. Off this that's show. Right. You're, you're fine. <laughs> that's good to hear. Um, so the competitive edge came out first and then how did you decide you were going to write this with Mark? You know, it's a great question. Mark's background in cognitive neuroscience and mm -hmm. my background in cognitive behavioral psychology really is a, is a nice fit. Uh, Mark has been interested in, in a long time in, in understanding how the brain works, how you know, he's, he's looking at that through uh, fMRIs, actually seeing the brain as it's functioning and so forth. And my background has been in uh, cognitive behavioral and sports psychology. I'm also the psychologist uh, for the Boston Marathon medical team and have done that for almost a decade now. The really? recent one that just went by. Absolutely. Yes, that's right. So can I ask, what happens when there's a marathon? Are you like there? At I'm, the in, I'm with the medical team at the finish line. Nice. And, and spend time working with runners who find, their, find themselves in the, in the medical tent. So anything from fears of, of uh, uh, needles because you need to, you're dehydrated, you need to have an IV or a blood draw, uh, to helping runners who may have had some sort of other pre-existing something going on. A little bit of disappointment, of course, um, but also pain management and, and so forth. So again, those are kind of symptoms, and those, those the things that we do in the medical tent, as far as psychology goes, is the cognitive behavioral piece, and that's what the winner's brain really is about: is the cognitive behavioral psychology, not just therapy, but psychology, because there are strategies that we can use to help the brain optimize itself. And not to stray too far from the book, but sure. do you have a lot of people during this huge marathon, which is worldwide, are there a lot of people in the tent coming for help? Right. And, and you know, we have, there's certain criteria to get into the medical tent that uh, you have to kind of be in a, in a position where you're needing a fairly acute, quick care. It's not just for blisters and, and needing an ice pack. Those, certain, those are certainly taken care of. Um, but folks who may be a little bit confused or they just pushed it too hard or medically something's going on and it might add to things like confusion or um, other, other things that, that might kind of surface as a, a psychological something. So I'm, I'm in place along with a top-notch team of physicians and nurses and physical therapists um, all there in the medical tent. It's uh, analogous to kind of like a, a MASH unit uh, where just about anything that comes in there uh, can be addressed. And they don't um, go into the tent and then come out and go running again. Or do no, some? They're, do they're done at that point. Yeah, I they're would They're done figure. at that point. That's right. There are checks, uh, checkpoints across uh, that folks can get medical attention if they need that throughout the course. Um, but it's been fun. I've, I've worked with the Boston Marathon for uh, nearly 10 years and also consult with the Chicago and Houston Marathon medical teams as well. So working with people who are focused on success and that goal laser that we mentioned earlier, these people are, are really uh, trying to optimize what their brains are capable of doing. And, they're, and they do incorporate their brains. Their training is physical, uh, but they also know that the mental aspect of performance is critical. 
Absolutely critical. Now, this is a fascinating thing because I think many people in our, in our audience are, are not aware of a medical tent that has psychologists as well as medical people. You just think of a doctor or a, right. you know, right. in the, uh, the emergency team. Right. But th that's fascinating, and thank you for sharing sure. that with glad, us. Sure, glad to do that. Glad yeah, so that. the book is The Winner's Brain, and you have a website. That's right, The Winner's Brain book or thewinnersbrain.com. Uh, folks can go on there and learn more about the uh, the brain power tools that we spoke about, uh, the opportunity radar and uh, focus laser and risk gauge, um, the effort accelerator, all those things that you need to do to align yourself. And those are skills uh, that, that also come along are, are called win factors. Those skills can be honed. There are things that we can actually do to develop those skills so we can we can reach success more. We spoke with folks like B.B. King. Uh, we, we visited with uh, the FBI Academy and did training with their firearms division for a couple of days. Uh, we spent time with Kevin Clash. Uh, people sometimes don't know exactly who Kevin Clash is, but they certainly know who Elmo is. And Elmo is, is, uh, is uh, on Kevin Clash's hand because he's the guy behind Elmo. And, and that's another story about opportunity and how he was able to, to take Elmo, a puppet that literally was uh, just kind of being tossed around and gave it life and gave it uh, the really international recognition that it is. And that's, again, Kevin's uh, brain is one that operates like a winner's brain and is, is a good example of how that um, is something that we can all grab a hold of. Have you read Think and Grow Rich? I haven't read that. You know of it though. I've heard of it. It's, it's like this, um, so I was going to ask you a question about it, but maybe I still will even though you haven't read it. Napoleon Hill says that there's a secret in the book and you're to read it from start to finish, which I've done, and I'm still looking for the secret. It's been like 20, 25 years and some, when someone said to me, oh it's persistence. Well, okay. But it's uh, maybe this relentless persistence. You kind of identify things, eight strategies great minds use. He kind of does that, but he's like throwing something that you're looking for and you're wondering, am I ever going to find it? Mm. Um, and, you know, can sheer persistence uh, be part of the winner's brain? Well, persistence is, is important, as is motivation and being able to stick with what it is you're trying to accomplish once you've set that goal. We have a chapter about motivation and being able to aim yourself that direction. It's Interesting too. Intuitiveness. Yeah, exactly. And being able to, to allow uh, things that could be distracting to not be distracting. Uh, staying focused, get rid of mundane sorts of things. Don't multitask. Don't spend time multitasking. <laughs> Prioritize what needs to be done and then get those things done so you can stay focused on your goal. It's interesting with this book that you're mentioning, you know, it, I'm assuming that it, it I, in fact, I can guarantee that it probably didn't have the access to the science and the technology that we it's have. It's about 60 years old, yeah. 70 years old, so, maybe 80. And there's still, yeah, so there's still a lot of validity to that book, but it's interesting um, how science changes how we write about uh, things like persistence, motivation, because it's really uh, science is revealing to us through technology what the brain can do. We're excited because we're curious what's, what, what's to come, what is still going to be happening as far as learning more about the brain. Uh, you know, things just keep turning over daily of interesting research, uh, critical research that helps us understand uh, these three pounds that we never want to get rid of uh, that, are, that are resting on our shoulders. You know, I always say that, that uh, our brain, we have very low overhead. We don't have to go and get the latest gadget. We already own it. We just need to optimize it. Oh, so true. Uh, I think they came really from that metaphysical standpoint without saying it, although Andrew Carnegie uh, gave the idea to Napoleon Hill to go and interview people. As you interviewed mm -hmm. Phyllis Diller mm -hmm. and these other personalities, mm -hmm. he went and interviewed rich people mm -hmm. because he wanted to know why they became rich. And he became, came up with this think and grow rich that you can grow richness like a farm by thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's right there in the title. Mm -hmm. Think and grow rich. But then you read this book and he says the secret is in there. And he did what you did. Now you've come with these strategies and with the science, I, I'd like to think that there's going to be a definite path for people by reading your book, reading his book, finding these resources so people don't have to just like struggle. There's too much struggling going on. That's right. And again, with the winner's brain, what we wanted to do was is to, to give strategies that were research-based. And again, there are lots of good stories <laughs> that individual people have. They're, they're, they're anecdotal. Um, they, we've got you know, great examples of people who've lived wonderful lives. 
but we're looking for some commonalities. What are the common denominators of people who are successful? What are their brains doing? And since we can actually, we don't have to crack the skull open to look at the brain any longer. That's historically what's happened. You know, we've had uh, all kinds of, of uh, things like phrenology, where we'd, we'd feel bumps on heads, and uh, I certainly didn't do that, but historically that's been happening in, in mental health, trying to understand about what the brain is, is telling us. We don't have to crack heads open either. We can look in there and see what are some common things. Now, everyone's brain is definitely different. We all have different faces. We have uh, different, uh, different appearances, and our brains all are different as well. But being able to, uh, to understand that uniqueness, but also at the same time, look at commonalities in successful brains, and then do something to infuse that into our lives. That's, that's really our ultimate goal. And gee, doctor, I really apologize because one of my other five personalities has aliens that do help him, yeah. but he's not here with us today. That's our so. next book about teamwork, <laughs> you and your aliens. <laughs> well, they're not my aliens, they're my other personalities oh, aliens, I see. so I it's see. kind of like a second cousin to me. Or a co-author. And it's, yeah. But it's hard for me to put my handle on it. So, gotcha. But, you know, um, this is all fun stuff, too, you can have with... with um, with a brain exercise, if you will. Right. Those are right. my brain exercises. That's right. Sure you don't have that straight jacket ready? <laughs> <laughs> but um, prime your brain. How do I prime my brain? Well, I think there are things that you can be doing to, uh, to make sure that we talked about the goal laser. Um, goal laser. Yeah, the, one of the, one of the um, brain power tools that we have. We interviewed um, Ramin Karamlu. Uh, Ramin was uh, born uh, in Iran. He, um, at age 12, went with a school group to see the Phantom of the Opera. And in seeing the Phantom of the Opera, he decided that he thought he would be the Phantom one day. That's what he <laughs> wanted to do. He wanted to grow up to be the Phantom. The Phantom. And um, so That's scary in, in and of itself. It is, but an admirable goal. And that goal laser where Ramin locked onto that, that particular thing that he wanted to do, didn't get sidetracked, built up his career in such a way that he eventually was the youngest man to ever play uh, the Phantom uh, in the Phantom, uh, Phantom of the Opera, and is currently um, the the new Phantom, or the uh, in Andrew Lloyd Webber's Love Never Dies, which just opened on London's West End a couple of months ago. So um, that's a great example of how do we prime our brain? What do we need to do? You have to have a goal to begin with, and then you have to have um, one of the first win factors that we talk about is self awareness, making sure that you understand how. You're interacting with the world, what you bring to the, to the, the playing field, what it is that, um, how does it people experience you, how do you experience others? Are you aware of that? Are you aware of your own skills and abilities? The talent meter, you have to have a, a, an ability to understand what your talent is. An interesting piece of research that you might find um, a, a bit compelling is uh, research where it was called, uh, it was revealed the double whammy of incompetence. Uh, subjects were asked to um, uh, perform a task. They didn't, they weren't good at the task, and they didn't realize that they weren't good at the task. So there was a double whammy. Not only did they, did they not have the skill, they didn't even realize they didn't have the skill. So that's just one example of the research that, that we think undergirds things like self-awareness, being able to understand what it is that you bring to the table, what skills do you have. We talked, you mentioned earlier about folks being authentic, that winners are authentic. They're authentic and also want feedback. They want to know what they're not doing well. B.B. King told us at the end of his interview, and we share in the book, that, that he needed to practice more. Uh, sort of like, you know, here's B.B. King, 84 years old at this point. Uh, well, he's, he's older and, and he long. He needs to practice more now. That's what he said. That's what he said. But that is a mark of a winner's brain, someone who continues to chug along uh, and work toward accomplishing what it is is their goal. And his goal is your enjoyment at his concert. And he's doing that like 200 dates a year or more. So again, a good example of a winner's brain that is moving toward a goal and is incorporating feedback. I've worked with Buddy Guy in the studio. Oh really, yeah. 1986-87, we have five songs we did with Buddy. These men are so extraordinary. When, when he shook my hand at the channel, Yes. when we were all involved, we were involved in this project for like a year and a half, and I'm like, Okay, he's my friend, but Buddy is like, this is the hand that God has touched these fingers. You know, it's like, Interesting. it was yes. an electric moment for me, even though I'd been already working with him. Joe, and he sees me, he shakes my hand, it's <laughs> like, it, you know, it's like Jimi Hendrix just touched my hand. It's Buddy Guy. It's like, these, these are extraordinarily gifted men. That's right. That, 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 that are way beyond anyone. They're way out of everyone's league. They're, they're, above, they're cut above. Very exceptional. 
I said to you before the interview that I wouldn't throw a hard question, but I do okay. have one hard one. All right, I'll do my best. Okay, Dr. Gene Landrum has a book, Eight Keys to Greatness. It's interesting, you have eight strategies. The Eight Keys to Greatness, I almost brought it with me too. I have Frank and Bro Rich in the car, I didn't get it. But um, Dr. Gene Landrum compares Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler. Hmm. He has an approach that greatness has to do a lot with manic depression or bipolar disorder. And um, why is there music? Wow, whatever. Um, okay, so Dr. Gene Landrum has this idea that it's manic depression. When you mention certain uh, people, and I'm thinking of the runners, obsession. Oh, oh no, it's the Phantom of the Opera guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Bela Lugosi, they said he died in his cape and they put him in the coffin in his cape. Now that's obsession. And the Phantom of the Opera guy, I'm saying like, wow, you're fixating on this like dark character. Mm -hmm. What happens to the individual fixating on this dark character? They've got to grab some of that and bring it into by osmosis. Mm. Good question. You know, I don't, having spoken with Ramin multiple times and, and, and knowing him uh, through those interviews, I don't think it was the dark character for his brain that was really the challenge and, and the draw. No, I didn't say it was, yep. but I'm saying yep. you rub up against a dirty barrel, you get dirty. And I didn't mean to call, I'm not calling mm -hmm. the Phantom dirty, I'm right. giving that as an example. Mm -hmm from a, a, um, a counselor once told me that. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing these things, a religious person that I, I admired mm -hmm. had, had brought up this thing. And I remember these things and I'm thinking, okay, if you add a little bit of um, blue to the, um, is it blue to the yellow? You get green, what is it? Whatever, you, you know, you, you add the colors and you get mm -hmm. another color. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and how does that affect them? Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they're bringing something into their consciousness which You've got to be a very strong personality, or even a right. psychologist, if, if, right. if someone's breaking down and crying in front of you. It's a great point. Maybe I can answer that a little bit with, um, we, we spoke with uh, Laura Linney, and Laura is a wonderful actress, uh, again, another person with a winner's brain, and she shared with us that uh, she uses all of her, you know, her, her, her brain, her body, all of that is, is uh, incorporated to learn about the role that she's to play. And I think that, um, I would think it's fair to say that uh, these folks do, they get involved in their role and that is their job uh, as a psychologist. That's my job. And you, you do have to be mindful that that is part of what you do. I love, I work with some of the, the best people in the world in my private practice. I think they're, they're folks that are a, a lot of winner's brains, a lot of things they're trying to solve or accomplish and so forth. Uh, Laura's example where uh, she um, pl uh, played the role of Abigail Adams on HBO's uh, John Adams, uh, the movie, and she talked about how she works specifically to understand that role and to learn about that role so she could then in turn use her skill. Uh, so she studied Abigail and she even shared at one point that Abigail Adams, uh, she run, had run across the fact that she was a bit uh, pigeon-toed. And so that helped her to understand more about her life and how that, um, how that character came out. So I think there are a multitude of ways of, of studying uh, folks and incorporating that um, in, into what their skills and abilities are. Um, and I think they're also good at, at, at recognizing that there are limits and boundaries, that, that, that their lives don't necessarily, um, uh, just because uh, you know, you're dealing with something dark or something unique or something funny or something outside of your culture, um, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to, to, to change your life in a way that you know, a winner's brain really enjoys that process and embraces that. And as my favorite counselor and psychologist says, the oracle from the Matrix, our time is up. Um, is it Dr. Jeff Brown? Jeff Brown's fine. Jeff you Brown, author, The Winner's Brain, and it's thewinnersbrain.com. Thank you for being part of Writer's Corner. Thank you, Joe. And Visual Radio. Thank and you. good luck with the book. Thank you. And thank you, everyone here at uh,